Okay, well, everyone finally arrived. Jeff Redding, Bobby Steele is here. He's sitting looking for our blues push box. Um, his microphone's on, so anytime he'd like to hey. uh, chime in and say hello. Uh, How you doing, people? Uh, so if you'd like to call in, and uh, we'll let Jeff uh, talk to him for a little while here. And if you'd like to call in and talk to Bobby Steele, 687-3515, we'll let you know when that's uh, going to happen. And, uh, well, take it away, Jeff. Hi, this is Jeff Renner from Vidmag TV, and we're bringing Bobby Steele and the Misfits into Cleveland Saturday night at Babylon. Not the Misfits. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm dead. Okay, Bobby was with the Misfits at one time, and we'll get into all that stuff a little bit later. We've been talking about Misfits here, so yeah, up it's, there, really. it's not <laughs> it's not overly surprising. Anyway, we're bringing we're bringing the undead into Babylon Saturday night, along with um, the Fiends, also from New Jersey, and our local favorites, the Floyd Band. Uh, Bobby, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Undead and how you got together and uh, what's everything all about? Well, it's just uh, the Undead's been around since I guess uh, since I got booted out of the Misfits in like October 1980. Got the Undead together by December. By January of '81, we were playing out already. We became like one of the like biggest bands in New York City, like within just like a few short months. But then uh, things kind of like turned sour as uh, the Misfits kind of like started like having us blacklisted from a lot of clubs around the country and telling people don't go to their shows and people like fools are like listening to them, believing them when they said the undead sucked and uh, <laughs> so for like seven years we couldn't do anything. I couldn't play anywhere. I was hospitalized for about a year and uh, for various illnesses and uh, problems and uh, it's taken me about seven years to like really get things going again and uh, get out of, uh, get Glenn out of the way and just get out there and play and things have been going great. The last album sold close to 10,000 copies. And uh, we're on tour now, man. It's just like it's going great. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty amazing feat to accomplish for a band that records and promotes and everything else of their own records and things. Um, there are a number of bands that have major label support that wish that they could do ten thousand copies of yeah. their record. Uh, yeah, the uh, the hospitalization thing is something that I definitely wanted to talk about. You've had a few bouts with things and. Uh, we were, we were talking last night and sort of decided that Bobby has a very large angel sitting on yeah. his shoulder. So um, why don't you why don't you tell me tell us about some of the stuff that um, that you've been through and the perseverance and the, the strength that goes behind this whole thing. All right. Well, I was I was born with a uh, I think a condition called spina bifida, which even like now is like ninety five percent fatal. So like for somebody to survive it back in the fifties was like pretty much a miracle. Then. Uh, when I was about 13, I came down with a tumor in my spine. It almost left me totally paralyzed. And uh, they actually told me that I was never going to walk again. And I w wound up walking out of the hospital about three weeks later. So uh, then it was like 1980. There was a big transit strike that was ready to go on in New York City. And like all the employees weren't like really doing their jobs right. And uh, I was going to get on the subway train. The conductor wasn't looking at, wasn't like doing his job. He wasn't paying attention to people getting on and off the train. And he closed the doors on my face and the train started to go and I was on this moving platform that goes out to like reach the, the cars and the platform went out from under me and I fell between the cars of this moving subway train and uh, I still don't know who the guy was that like thought quick and just like grabbed me by the back of my jacket and yanked me back up on the platform but like I guess I kind of owe my life to that guy and I was <laughs> like well uh, the lawsuit from that actually financed most of this album <laughs> and uh, it was I think it was a result of that, of that accident that I, I came down with this really bad infection in one of my toes and it, it uh, developed into gangrene. I just kept ignoring it because I was doing a lot of drugs at the time and uh, eventually turned into osteomyelitis which is where your bones just like start to rot and you just like start to fall apart and eventually my toe fell off and they were going to amputate my leg which I wasn't about to go for and from the hospitalization I came down with hepatitis and started like losing weight. I was down to about 118 pounds at one point. I mean I looked real bad. And uh, they really didn't think I was going to live. They had me, like, written off as dead. They had me in a terminal, you know, the terminal ward. It was like a glass booth, like, right over the morgue. When I woke up in the morning to, like, look out at the sun, I just saw them carrying out corpses, you know. That kind of shook me up. I said, no, this isn't good for my image, man. I can't die. <laughs> yeah, this is the undead. <laughs> and now, please give a warm welcome. It's been a long time. Bobby Steele's been wanting to come down here for quite some time. And finally got him in. <laughs> And undead!
some people around here. Um, some people might be aware of the fact that I've been fighting censorship with my show VidMag, and um, the undead kind of ran into a little bit of a uh, struggle along that line. Yeah, um, a priest at a local Catholic church in Iowa told his congregation that I was a devil worshiper and that I sacrificed puppies on stage. And uh, he got like a whole bunch of people to start going around harassing the club owners. It was like, you know that movie Footloose or like Elvira? Mm -hmm. It was like that kind of a situation where like the priest kind of like has like the entire like, you know, all the politicians in town like under his thumb and stuff. And it was like the police were coming and like threatening the club owner. And if I called and like asked anything about it, they were like, oh, we know nothing about it. You know, one of those kind of deals it was like really getting spooky. So, um, there was like a lot of threats. There were, there were uh, gunshots at, at the club. The marquee was damaged. They had uh, just constant threats. They wouldn't like, you know, anytime flyers were put up, the flyers were torn down. The owner of the club was threatened with a $200 per flyer fine. And uh, we just couldn't get any response out of the police or anything. Like, like nothing was going on. They didn't know anything about these threats and everything. So uh, what I finally had to do was bring in the FBI and bring in like all of like national media. And once the police realized that like, you know, the whole world was watching them. Things pretty much cooled down. We had maybe like, I don't know, 30, 40 people waiting outside the club for us when we got there with baseball bats and stuff. But uh, nothing really happened. We kind of scared them off. I just kind of like smiling, shook the leader of the gang's hand, and that kind of like freaked them all out. And after that, they just turned around and left. Now, um, you have a number of things that are or have been available in the past. The uh, the first thing that was recorded, there were two songs on a uh, an old compilation back in was it 1981, right? On yeah. more cassettes 82. called New York Thrash, 82. 82 yeah. Called New York Thrash. There were two songs off of that. Yeah. Then came a uh, four well, song EP. Actually, the stuff on the four song EP was recorded first. Okay. That was recorded. Well, why don't you Why don't you give us the the rundown of how that all? Okay. Yes. Yeah, the stuff on the first four song EP, Nine Toes Later, was recorded in uh like August. We started recording in August of 81, and uh, originally Glenn Danzig was producing it, and uh, he was one who actually put up the money for us in the beginning, and I had to, I had to buy those tapes from him after he decided he wasn't going to put it out. He didn't, like, he didn't like the fact we were getting a lot of good press. The thing that really, like, I think really, like, triggered the whole feud between the Misfits and me was uh, an article in Sounds Magazine that Tim Summers was, like, now on, like, MTV and everything. He, he referred to us as uh, the best American group within memory, and he said that uh, we had accomplished more in our first six months than the Misfits had accomplished in the entire seven years that they've been together so far. And uh, that's that's what really like launched the whole feud, because after that, all of a sudden, Glenn came out and was like, this record sucks, I don't want to have anything to do with it, you know? Yeah, that's that's the article right there. It, uh, that was when the whole Misfits feud really started. All of a sudden, it was like, the record sucks, I'm not putting it out. If you, if you want it, you can buy it back from me. You know? A lot of, a lot of. I'm sure you people probably have heard like you know sto stories and seen stuff in the fanzines, but you know I mean all kinds of things they said about me, you know, and it was it was pretty funny. I mean really, but uh, people took it seriously. <laughs> and the undead are still here. Um, after the uh, the Nine Tails Later EP came out, then you later went back and you reissued everything on uh, a mini album called Never Say Die. Yeah, I did. Uh, what happened was I had I had released Nine Toes Later, then in '83 I released um, Verbal Abuse Misfit 45. That was actually I recorded that in my bedroom, and uh, I think that was actually the most expensive thing we ever did because to record in my bedroom we had to spend about ten thousand dollars on recording equipment. And uh, then in '84 uh, 80, we really did like virtually nothing. We were in the studio recording and just like trying to get our act together, and I was going to school learning to be a recording engineer. Then in late, late 85, we released the Never Say Die 45, and then in 86, we released the Never Say Die LP, which was a compilation of the 345s that uh, Slabel in Germany wanted to do something with us, and so I figured, hey, if they want to screw us or anything, I can at least give them this stuff, and at least it won't be any big loss, because I've already done what I can do with it. They screwed us. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, thanks a lot for coming down. Come on, let's hear some noise. I'm going to tell you, Jordan. 
Listen, we're taping this thing for Big Mac TV, so like, pretend you're into it, all right? <laughs> Ask any questions to Bobby Steele, you can call in now at 687-3515. Okay, yeah, I know what you want to know about. Um, the first time he said he was going to play Never Stay Dying and it actually came out as verbal abuse was because he was playing the German pressing of it where uh, for some reason these idiot Krauts uh, <laughs> turned around and uh, re-edited the, the, the order of the songs even though all the artwork had been laid out by, you know, out here by me and the labels had been laid out out here by me. and. Uh, they just decided for some stupid reason to uh, change the order of the songs. <laughs> Every DJ in the country when this record came out was like writing back saying, what am I playing? <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Um, okay, now why don't we talk about the new record. Um, there, It's called Act Your Rage, which is what you're on tour here for. Yep. And uh, some pretty hot stuff there. There's a, it seems to be a, a little bit of a change in direction in the band from some of the older stuff to the stuff that's on this record. Well, I like to screw around with stuff. It's kind of like uh, we just like take like turns here and there, and then we come back and do you know do a little bit more of the traditional undead stuff. And you know, I don't like to get boring, so I, you know I'm I get bored easily, so I just like kind of like mess around with styles and have a little bit of fun with myself. I don't take the thing too seriously, you know. But uh, we just do whatever. Now you had an offer to uh, to open up some shows for Testament from because of this record. Uh, yeah, yeah, we actually got offered uh, to open up for Testament last uh, December out in L.A., but we were only out there for the beginning of November, so I wasn't going to stick around for a month just to do, like, one or two shows. So it would have been fun. Yeah, there's a... I notice as I'm looking at the uh, at the recording order on here, there's a version of Rat Fink, which was originally a uh, Misfits tune. Yeah, yeah, I had and to do that. We were uh, talking about that last night. Why don't you tell us the story of Rat Fink? Uh, well... It was originally called Ragma. It was like, I think it was like the number one song for like the entire year of 1953. Then in uh, like, I guess like 64, 65, this guy Alan Sherman, who's kind of like a weird owl of the 60s, had a hit record called Hello Mother, Hello Father, and this was a B-side, and actually Glenn was the one who noticed it first, and he uh, came to practice one day and was like, I got this great song, we gotta do it, and he just like showed us the chords, and we just like, just went out and did it, and it was always like a real fun song, and uh, the 45 was always like really popular with that. But uh, the, re the actual reason why it wound up an undead song was they had actually told people that they kicked me out of the band because I sucked on guitar, that Doyle was a much better guitarist than me, and uh, which I knew was, you know, total bull at the time. So when we were going to do a show opening up for them at the Ritz in New York City. For the Misfits? Yeah. And... Uh, we decided, you know, these guys have been saying how bad I am on guitar and how I suck. We know they're not going to do Rat Fink. Oh. We're going to do Rat Fink just to show them up. And we did that. And you never saw such fury come out of these guys. I mean, they, they like, ripped the brass railings off the balcony and threw them at us. It was, like, after that, it was just, like, total war. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> 
Tim Stegall of uh, he was running for Flipside magazine at the time. Okay, I'll call you. Re uh, referred to the song as the only version of Evil Destruction that doesn't make him want to puke. That's pretty cool. And I know this, this actually even appeared on like some um, radio stations that just play classic rock. They just like kind of like caught on to this version and played it out in New York. So, play it. so for those who listen to the classic rock stations here in Cleveland, and we know who they are. Uh, you might want to call in and request Eve of Destruction. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm that one over there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Actually, they would do is when, I, when, I when these got sent out, I put a thing in there and give it the correct order, but I guess it got lost. Because yeah. I caught it right away. Yeah. I was like, oh man, you fools. <laughs> Yeah, and if you want to, uh, uh, they're in there, we could just write the name and phone number down on another piece of paper if you want some pair of tickets away, we still have some. I think we've got yeah, like, right. five pairs that you gave to the stage for here, so. We'll maybe do that right at the end, have a couple of people call tickets, because I gave a couple of pairs away already. Some people might be aware of the fact that the original Misfits singles um, are, are worth a considerable amount of money these days. What, uh, which records were, were the ones that you were on? Horror Business, Night of the Living Dead, Three Gets from Hell, Halloween. Seems like I'm missing something in the middle there, but I can't remember what. So you're actually with the band, what, 79 through 81? Was 79 through 80. Through 80. Was yeah, actually, I, I joined in October of uh, 80. I mean, I joined in October 78, and I left in October of 80. Okay. And then there's um, one other um, sort of connection that we haven't talked about yet. Sam Hain. Why don't you uh, tell us the interesting story behind that? Okay. Uh, I actually got a call from this band back in, like, 80, I guess it was 82, this band called Morning Noise, that they were doing a they were doing a record and they, they wanted me to come in and just do like a guest spot on the guitar with them. So I they sent me a tape of their stuff it was really good. So I went and I sat in with them and the drummer was Steve Zing. So uh, after Morning Noise broke up and I was looking for a drummer, actually what happened with that? Oh, that's a funny story. My drummer had like I had this drummer who had like really really bad stage fright, and uh, he he had to get like seriously high before like going on stage and stuff. Like literally had to start the night before, and th this time oh, he was. Wow. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> And this time he was like so nervous that he took 25 quaaludes the night before the show and like wound up in a coma. So we had to like real quickly get a drummer and I knew Steve pretty much knew the stuff so I like just like gave him a tape of the stuff and we like we made a tape loop and he just like listened to the stuff all night in his sleep and the next day we just went up and did the show. And uh, so eventually he, he became, a, he joined the undead and uh, then Glenn came to him and was like, you know, look, man, you know, I'll give you, you know, all this money if you join, you know, if you join Sam Hain, I'll pay you know, like fifty dollars a night and all this kind of stuff. So Steve quit the Undead to join Sam Hain, and then about six months later, quit Sam Hain and came back to the Undead. We had started recording the album in uh, '84, and then Steve quit to join Sam Hain, and I used a couple of other drummers in the meantime. And then when he quit Sam Hain and came back, we recorded the last few songs on the album. It's a pretty funny story, and you know the whole situation was pretty crazy because here he was making money with Sam Payne, good money, and he would rather be playing in the undead than not. Okay, we have a uh, caller coming through, so we'll give this a shot here. I'm not too familiar with how to do it. Uh, 
Hello, caller. You're uh, on the air, Bob. Can you uh, hear I wanted to say that. Hello. Well, hello. I like the way that Eve of Destruction went. Thanks a lot. Hey, I, uh, I wonder if you're familiar with a lot of the other anti-war songs out of the uh, mid-60s. Phil Oaks, for instance, and of course Bob Dylan. Well, I'm familiar with Bob Dylan, but really not with Phil Oaks. Because Phil Oaks has a couple tunes like uh, I Ain't Marching Anymore and a couple others you might want to look into recording down the line. Because uh, I'd like to see a good, strong anti-war movement again. And with you guys doing the music, it might just catch on. Well, I, I tell you, I don't think we're going to need uh, an anti-war move. I don't think this thing, if you're talking about the Iraq thing, I don't think it's going to go too far. If, you, uh, if you're up on, like, uh, the Bible or if you're up on, like, um, Nostradamus, he refers to uh, what's going on right now as the final conflict. And uh, he uses the word conflict, which uh, kind of, like, means, you know, it doesn't mean an all-out war. And he says that after the final conflict, we're going to have a thousand years of world peace. And if you look at what's going on right now, We've got that, potent that potential, so I'm kind of like looking at it that uh, the thing's going to back down. He's going to realize that you know he made a boo boo, and he's going to uh, he's going to back out of Kuwait, and you're not going to see any problems for you know a long time. You're just going to straighten out the whole financial situation. That's more what I'm looking at is uh, getting more people to care about other people, and you know don't really worry about the war. I think the war's going to take care of itself. I, uh, unfortunately, I think you're wrong, and uh, I'm really scared. Uh, President Bush has. Uh, ambitions for the very rich in this country, the, the elite, and uh, he's, he's set up a situation where we have to go to war. I've heard, I've heard that argument. I mean, I heard that argument about Ronald Reagan, too. I, in fact, uh, the undead were invited to do a, a Rock Against Reagan tour back in, I guess it was like 80 or 81. Yeah, I remember that. And, they came through here and, and uh, MDC was on there. You know, they were talking about like how, you know, how many horrible things Reagan done, how he done Social Security cutbacks and all that kind of stuff. And uh, what the guy didn't realize was that I'm on Social Security, and it was after Ronald Reagan became president that my Social Security went from $240 a month to $420 a month overnight. Okay, when he was talking Social Security cutbacks, he was talking about these Hollywood movie stars who are bringing in several million dollars per film, well, and they're still collecting on Grandpa's Social Security, who died 20 years ago. And that's where he made his cuts. And then the guy was running the rock against Reagan, so I said, said Yours only went up a hundred dollars. Mine went up six hundred dollars. Well, so, actually, you're wrong about that, and I know that personally too. You're wrong. Did your social security go up or down? Well, my social security doesn't matter. What matters is the people that are receiving. But the situation in the Persian Gulf. Let me tell you something, okay? Everybody's into bashing Reagan, okay? You know when my social security was taken away from me? It was in the Carter administration. It was taken away. It wasn't until Reagan became president that it came in, okay? It's real easy to, you know, to condemn a president. I mean, you know, put yourself in, in his shoes. You can't please everybody all the time, you know? And, like, all you can do is make your best judgments. Well, I believe you're entirely wrong, and unfortunately we're all going to find out about it here real soon. Well, I hope I'm not. That's all I can say. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot.
Okay. Well, we're starting to run out of time. We've got just a little bit of time left. So uh, got a couple more things that Bobby wants to say over here. And once again, um, we are with Bobby Steele from The Undead, ex of The Misfits. And uh, we've got time for maybe one more phone call if, if it comes in really quickly. Questions. Yes, if you <laughs> want to talk about The Undead or The Misfits, or the show Saturday night at Babylon, The Misfits. And the, <laughs> I did it again. Uh, the, <laughs> the Undead, featuring Bobby Steele of The Misfits, and The Fiends, and our local favorites, the Floyd Band. Oh, okay, yeah, we're gonna uh, give away some tickets right now. How many sets do we have? Uh, we'll give away one, so you have some of them. Okay, we're we'll gonna give away, give away one, uh, one set of tickets right now to the show, so... Uh, yeah, second call. Give it to the second call. It's an all-ages show, and they'll be playing with the Fiends, who they brought along with them from New Jersey, and with our local favorites, the Floyd Band. Floyd Band, incidentally, has a new album out called um, I burped and puke came out my nose. It's <laughs> being released um, very, very shortly, and uh, you might um, you might want to go check out their release party Friday night, tomorrow night at Fantasy Theater. Bobby, um, yeah. do you have anything else that you want to say to our audience um, before we close things up? Thanks for having me in your living room and uh, come down to the show Saturday. Nothing else about it. <laughs> okay, I guess that'll do it. <laughs>
guys right, man. You guys can like go home and like sit still. Let's like get up your asses and fucking move. Yeah. Give you a little dance music. <laughs>
forgot to tell you this. We got a mailing list. There's a table mm -hmm. over in the corner there. We sell t-shirts, records, tapes, all that kind of bullshit. We also got postcards to get on the mailing list. Fill them out so you know who the fuck you are.
song I pretty never thought we'd be playing.